I'll put a foot on a lab and walk around with it. Everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My name is Christian Mehta, and I'm the Vice President of Inclusion and Equity at the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Greater Toronto Chapter. I am also the co-chair of the Diversity to Inclusion series. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here today to the second event in this series with a special focus on South Asian philanthropy. Before I invite Aditya Jha, the co-chair of this conference, to deliver the keynote address, I would like to provide you with a short background about this initiative. Ontario's urban centres are amongst the, most world, amongst the world's most diverse places anywhere, especially in North America. Three million people here consider themselves to be visible minorities, and in recent years, we've made some considerable strides in areas such as gender equity, accessibility, and diversity training across many sectors. And as some of you may know, it is expected that by 2017, there will be well over one million South Asians living in Toronto. These are and remain important contextual notes and a kind of backdrop for this project. Last year, in partnership with AFP Toronto and Ottawa, we applied for funding through the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration's Partnership Project Office to launch a series that would take a long-term view on inclusion by uncovering stories of giving amongst emerging donor groups and to carve out a dedicated space for an honest exchange on how to strengthen our work and our relationships with the community. Our project is really a number of organized presentations that bring together, for the first time anywhere in Canada, donors, fundraisers, volunteers, and nonprofit managers to look at what we know, what we don't know about giving within the community, and how we can work together to become a world-class, forward-thinking, and inclusively-minded sector. We are very fortunate to have secured the patronage of the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, the Honourable David Onley. His honour cannot be here with us today, but we'll be sure to provide him with all the details and outcomes of today's proceedings. However, I do want to acknowledge the participation of many of the board members here from both the AFP Toronto chapter and the Ottawa chapter. So if you are here, please, uh, please rise and we can give you a round of applause. Thank you for joining us today supporting this initiative. Over the next three years, in addition to this conference, the association will be organizing similar gatherings looking at philanthropy within the following communities. The Jewish community, African, Caribbean, Muslim, Hispanic, and indigenous groups. As some of you know, a couple of weeks ago, we held our first conference looking at philanthropy in the Chinese community and guess what? We had 150 people there, so that's a really great start for us. Today, we have 180 people, so we're really excited about how this is growing and spreading like wildfire. While we are cutting across diasporas, cultures, and faiths, we are also going to be focusing on philanthropy in women, LGBT groups, people with disabilities, youth, and Francophone Ontarians. Each of these conferences will be video recorded and archived for future reference on our website, afpinclusivegiving.ca. The best part is that all of these materials will be available for free and the conversations will continue online through our discussion boards and social media. We've also begun or started a hashtag here. So if you look on the screens there behind you, you'll see hashtag inclusive giving. So if you are tweeting, please, uh, about this event, please use this and follow along um, after the proceedings as well. We have articulated five learning outcomes for this project. First, we want to develop our intercultural competencies. We also want to rethink and examine the ways in which fundraisers identify, cultivate, solicit, and thank donors. Third, we want to learn about the best ways to promote and engage people on the ground and at leadership levels. We want to gain an appreciation also 
of the nuances found within each community. This is what I call the diversity within diversity factor. And finally, we want to offer cross-cultural networking opportunities and develop a research initiative that may stem from these events. At the end, we hope to have created a foundation from which new conversations will emerge and more advanced information sharing can take place. This is a first time for our sector in Ontario and in Canada. Some have even noted that this may be the first time in North America that we've approached diversity, inclusion, and giving, the study of those three things, with such rigor and deep coordination. So let's treat this moment, let's treat this conference, the conference from two weeks ago and the future conferences, as an opening conversation. So thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm going to introduce Aditya Jha in one moment. Thank you. When I first met Aditya Jha about five years ago, he was already making some major philanthropic moves in Ontario and back home. Aditya brings to the table a key eye on the tangible outcomes of giving and thinks critically about the relationship between philanthropy and entrepreneurial work. I guess that makes sense, especially given that Aditya is one of the most successful serial entrepreneurs that I know. I'm not going to recount everything that you can read in the bio and the bios in front of you there, but I do want to highlight a couple of things. First, what's not listed, or something that you might not know at first glance, is that Aditya holds a very special power, a power that I call infectious philanthropy. He gives as an example to others, and somehow it sticks, it spreads far and wide. In fact, I would argue that he, along with many of the other speakers today, have propelled South Asian giving forward in Ontario, taking the charitable soul of this community out of the limelight. Secondly, Aditya has, be, has some very provocative thoughts about the fundraising professional. He always says, yes, fundraisers need to be well-trained. Go to as many conferences as you'd like. But they also need to be well-tuned. And I'm sure we're going to hear more about that this afternoon. Aditya has received countless accolades for the impact he has made on the South Asian community, the business community, and the philanthropic community at large. Earlier this month, he was named a member of the Order of Canada. And this is certainly a great culmination of all of his efforts. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Aditya Jha to join me on stage. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful and not that much uh, accurate uh, praise of mine. And I just to copy somebody whom I really admire, and he said, after hearing all these good things, I will have to go to the temple for two reasons. One is that I will have to pray and tell God that, hey, this was not all true. I didn't tell him anything, but he did say it, so I'm sorry. And the second thing I really, and the second thing is I really liked it. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry for that also. So anyway, I will go there. Uh, I think one thing is definitely not true that, as he mentioned, I am... Uh, I'm a very, he's the most successful entrepreneur. By the way, I'm, I don't consider myself even successful because the way I parse the word successful is the one who is full of success. I don't know anybody who is full of success because to me, success is an event, it is not a state. So nobody is successful. There is, if there is any word which should be there, it should be failure full because we have more failures <laughs> than we have success. So good afternoon and welcome to you all for coming together to celebrate the spirit of giving and sharing. Our presence here is testimony of our awareness of engaging ourselves for larger social causes. The title of my presentation is a little, funny, a little bit funny, South Asian Philanthropy, Giving, Selling, Training, and Tuning. So that's the title, to understand South Asian Philanthropy. These are my reflections from being a South Asian philanthropist 
running my own small private foundation, a South Asian community activist, an entrepreneur having been involved in major, major as an entrepreneur and having been involved uh, with the uh, major fundraising com campaigns for university and above all being very passionate about promoting and nurturing the idea that new Canadians have a special obligation to give to the mainstream causes. I'm going to present before you four themes that may provoke you to look differently at philanthropy among South Asian and how to approach it. And these themes are South Asian philanthropy and the, its cultural aspect, giving a charity to self or to others, minority majority Canada, giving to mainstream causes. And the last one is what um, uh, um, you heard uh, just now, the training or tuning for fundraising professionals. So these are the four themes I will be touching upon. The South Asian subcontinent majorly consists of five religious groups, Hindu, Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, and Jains. Giving to causes beyond your own self is deeply ingrained in the cultural and religious ethos of the South Asian society. This is the month that just celebrated 150 years of great Indian saint and philosopher Swami Vivekananda. I saw a quote from him plastered on the walls of main streams of Mumbai and that read, they alone live who live for others. The Puranas, which is the Indian um, uh, text, are a genre of important Hindu, Jain, Buddhist, and Sikh religious text, notably consisting of uh, narratives of the history of the universe from creation to destruction, genealogies of kings, heroes, sages, and demigods, and descriptions of Indian cosmology, philosophy, and geography. And the great sage, Vedavyas, who has given important religious text to India, summarized the gist of all religious text and said in a Sanskrit sloka, and what he said that in all 18 volumes of Puranas, he wanted to convey just two things, to help others, to help others un under all circumstances in the life without sinning, to hurt others and neglect others' suffering in fact, is the life of sinning. One of the most important principles of Islam is zakat, that all things belong to God, and that the wealth is therefore held by a human being in trust. The word zakat means both purification and growth. Our possessions are purified by setting aside a proportion of those in need, and like the pruning of plants, this cutting back balances and encourages new growth. These are very powerful cultural and religious aspects of lives of South Asians. Now in the context of the South Asian giving in Canada, I would like to take you to the first theme of my presentation, and that is philanthropy and its cultural aspect. The Asians in general, and Canadians of South Asian origin in particular, share the following. There are definitively exceptions to what I'm going to describe, but these are my generalized opinions that need to be understood, reflected, and debated in order to gainfully engage South Asians in giving back to the mainstream Canadian social causes in a significant way. First, for South Asians, their legacy is their children. And they are accustomed to giving and living back all that they earn to their children, which is con in contrast with the wealthy in the West, for whom their legacy is la in large way is what they leave for the society. Secondly, for new immigrants, there is a hidden fear factor and lag in recognition that it is the high time that they should start giving back. They have this subconscious level fear that something bad may happen in the future and they have not made enough that they should start giving back now. Thirdly, the South Asian immigrants have come from a social system where all institutions of public purpose has always been fully supported by their governments. And hence, generally, they think that it is the job of the government to support universities, hospitals, museums, operas, and symphony, etc. They also think that these institutions have very large financial needs 
and only government can provide for it as their own means comparatively are so insignificant. Lastly, when South Asians look at the richness of these public institutions, and we are here, I was just speaking with somebody that can we ever imagine having a library like this in India and having all these facilities. So th th there is a, they see the contrast to the poor state and institutions back in their native country and how far the dollar can go in their native country then they are motivated to give back to uh, back for the causes in their na native country. It is with this background and further reflections and discussions, the community leaders and fundraising professionals need to approach this highly potent group of South Asians that is the largest growing population segment in Canada and is relatively highly resourceful. I would like to take you to the next theme of my presentation and that is giving charity to self or others. I have an unconventional definition for philanthropy and I would like to separate it from the definition of charity. It needs to be further elaborated and defined and contextualized. Here is the rough and quick version. Philanthropy, I was looking at the uh, dictionary definition uh, and I found some of these things. The major religions of the world are based on the ideals of love of humankind. The actual meaning of the word philanthropy. Because of its universality, the concept of caring for one another can be taught in its cross-cultural perspective without bias towards one religious belief or another. Philanthropy is the desire to promote the welfare of others expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. On the other hand, charity is also similar, generosity and helpfulness, especially towards the needy or suffering, which is also about aid given to those in need. The term philanthropy and charity are used interchangeably. However, I would like to submit that we need to see giving beyond the paternalistic attitude, that I am more able and you are needy and hence being a good human being, I'm helping you. I wish to coin a new definition of philanthropy that is, giving, that is giving to your expanded self and giving to your passion. It is not primarily about helping others. Rather, it is about giving your resources to what you are passionate about. As a result of giving to your expanded self, what is happening is others are directly and indirectly benefiting. For example, you believe in a society where there should be equal opportunity for all, and you understand that would only happen if you support those who are less fortunate. You're doing this because of a belief, and not because you want to help that poor person. If you believe in and enjoy art and cultural performances, and would like to support those institutions and individuals where you would find your passion served well, it is about giving to your expanded self and passion, but major beneficiary of that is the society and larger community. For lack of a better term, I would call this enlightened giving as philanthropy. I wish to share my own personal example and sometimes it does give me a guilt feeling about I am going to share with you. I have found that once philanthropic deeds and giving, if it is organized and impactful and sustainable, then one is not only serving her passion and expanded self, but you also materially benefit in a significant way. I won't be standing in front of you having this opportunity to chair this conference and giving this keynote speech, but for my philanthropic work and philanthropic persona. I would not have be even been considered by the Ryerson University for the honorary doctorate, but for the work I have done for the Aboriginal community and my partnership with the Arias University for the Aboriginal project. I have no doubt that my receiving order of Canada is aggregated outcome of all the work I have done with the universities, the Canadian Aboriginal community, my leadership role with the community organizations, and my philanthropy giving to several mainstream causes. It has allowed me to interact with the who is who of the Canadian political and corporate world. It has opened doors for me, which otherwise would not have happened. And that's why I said that sometimes I have the guilt feeling. My question to all of you is, is philanthropy not about giving to your expanded self and even to your material self? Helping others is a byproduct and your expanded self
touches beyond the physical boundaries of your family and your vested interests. While I've just scratched surface through mostly, though mostly in a focused way through my own private charitable foundation at the universities and other institutions and within my own circle of influence, I must admit that I have found the journey of graduation from charity to philanthropy happening over years. It doesn't happen just like that. And it has been the most rewarding thing in my own life. Now I have made it a personal passion to aggregate my philanthropic efforts working with the highly successful members of the South Asian diaspora in Canada so that they give significantly to public causes. It is with this quest that I'm here today in front of you and I would implore that the fundraising professional community in Canada needs to think differently in order to engage the South Asian groups. That takes me to the third theme of my presentation, minority majority Canada, giving to mainstream causes. Our Canada is inching towards a country where the minorities together will form the majority of Canada. Canada is aging and the new Canadian group is relatively younger. The pace of wealth creation in the South Asian group is happening in a significant way. You don't find the, find the likes of rich Peter Monk and other people among South Asians, but the number of multimillionaires is significant. Are the fundraising professionals readying themselves to tap into the giving of this significant group and the demographic dividend that can come from the emergence of this group? There is, there is this general notion among the South Asian that my time to give is not there yet. It all depends on how we think about giving. We never have a spare money to give, but I have no doubt in my mind that we can always spare to give. There is an obligation for the rich to give and think about what social causes they can cultivate to be passionate about. And the word is to cultivate to be passionate about. All of us here could earn large wealth only because we live under fortunate social circumstances. Let's not fool ourselves by giving all credit to our success, to our talent. As we don't create those favorable social circumstances by ourselves. Imagine for a moment that if we were left in Peru or Liberia or Ethiopia, then how much of our talent could have produced for us in those nations? or if we were born into a poor African family, how much of talent we would have developed if we were part of those circumstances? And geographies. Nobel laureate Herbert Simon estimated that the social capital is responsible for at least 90% of what people earn in wealthy societies. At least 90%, least, in the wealthy societies. I'm trying to make a case here that all of us have an obligation to give and pay back to that social capital. And all of us can spare to give and give to the mainstream causes as we created our wealth in this country. We need to give to the social capital as that alone has allowed us to succeed. Now I'd like to bring your attention to the last theme of my presentation, training or tuning of fundraising professionals. While the significant wealth creation in Canada is happening in the South Asian groups and amongst the new Canadians, the extent and the pace of giving back for the social causes of Canada by them have been very slow. In my humble opinion, the fundraising professionals, while being so professionally trained in their trade, have not fully understood the psyche of the South Asian groups and the opportunity that it presents. They have also not fully understood the demographic shift of Canada, aging Canada, and Canada slowly turning into majority minority Canada. There is a demographic dividend to be reaped, but that will happen only with new realization of the realities of today's economy, as well as what will tickle this new group of potential donors think. In my considered opinion, it is a journey, and also more importantly, tuning of the first of the fundraising professionals, as well as of the creating motivational environment for the South Asian groups to give to the mainstream causes. And I'm not getting into the details what I think uh, could be those motivational um, uh, environment. 
For us to reap the demographic dividend, it requires radical transformation in approach and thinking of fundraising professionals beyond the existing well-tested technical parameters of public fundraising. Fundraising professionals need to find motivational approaches to draw South Asians. Fundraising professionals should not have too much faith and be rigid with the technical parameters of fundraising raising that has worked in past and worked with the mainstream community. And I had one frustrating example, and I'm not going to mention, that we wanted a South Asian to give to, for a center to be named. And I wanted, I knew that he will give slowly. So let's start with one million. But they were, for, to name a center, but they were so rigid, it has to be 10 million. I even challenged the vice president. I said, can you name me one person in the whole of Canada for that specific purpose who you know you can motivate to give him to give $10 million? He couldn't say that, but he wouldn't take the money. I said, you've got to draw them in. So what is the first dose of that opium that the South Asian need to, be ta need to taste so that they want to come back and want more of that to give significantly to public causes? It is not about having a separate committee of South Asians or give prominent role for, for a South Asian. Rather, how would the mainstream of fundraising professionals tune to the South Asian giving or for that matter to the new Canadians? As our societies are becoming more prosperous and more democratic, the instruments of wealth creation are no longer aggregated in the hands of governments. When people at the lowest strata of the different geographies are exposed to what is available there in the world to enjoy. All are aspiring to be, to be able to use the common infrastructure and all, wa all wants a chance to have it. Governments cannot provide those infrastructure and conditions alone. There is a greater need to public-private partnership to address this massive social need and social giving. There is a viability gap that needs to be addressed and provided for in a collective way. I am a great admirer of private giving and especially the great support it has provided in creating world-class infrastructure in the Western world and the massive support to life-threatening causes around the world. One of the most notable things that private giving is is that it is not beholden to lobbying or political considerations of public giving or major wastages caused by large-scale bureaucratic, not-for-profit, charitable organizations. Private philanthropists are free to venture where the governments and politicians are fear, fear to tread. However, you may be shocked to know that the wealthiest individuals of the world give only 9% to charitable causes and at the same time 2% for their pets. <laughs> and rest go to their kids. The legendary Warren Buffett says he believes in giving his children enough so they feel they could do anything. But not so much that they could do nothing or need to be motivated to do nothing. Let us pause over this statement that I said just now. How we of South Asian origin think about our accumulated wealth. How do the trained but not tuned fundraising professionals of Canada think about this and approach the aspect of democratic, demographic dividend. I must admit that I have been active in the world of sharing my fortunate circumstances only for the last 10 years and have picked up some experience that I would like to share with you. First, be active with the cause that you give to. Where you are actively involved with your money, time and talent to a cause that you are passionate about, there will be multifold impact than the paternalistic mode of giving where you just cut a check. Your presence and involvement allows stringent control, oversight, and the cause benefits immensely from your insight that you have accumulated by virtue of being so successful. I'm using the word again. Philanthropy of affluence has given rise to new business that is business of philanthropy, which in many cases leads to wastage akin to running large bureaucratic type of organizations in the long run harms the cause of philanthropy. Large number of third world philanthropic delivery, and even in Canada, is disgusting and wasteful. In, in the developed world, there is this mentality amongst the people involved in fundraising and project execution that for doing something good, you need abundance of resources. 
people who give majority majorly are very frugal in their own life and therefore they accumulate wealth. But it is amazing that their own generous giving resulting of frugal accumulation is managed sometimes with affluent wastage. Hence my strong suggestion that be active with your giving and choose projects that you are passionate about. Your entrepreneurial presence will do much good than what your money alone will do. Before I became active with giving, I looked at giving a charity to others. others. Now I see giving a charity to myself. You are giving to your expanded self, your passion, your talent to make change, and to your obligation to pay back to the favorite social circumstances so that those circumstances are sustainable for yourself, your kids, and, and for all that you care about. Last but not least, I'd like to make a case that we should support mainstream Canadian philanthropic projects in major way. And international projects as well as projects in South Asia with a lesser portion of what of our total giving. Most of the successful South Asian professionals and entrepreneurs here have done relatively better than those who have been in Canada for generations. We have become successful by delivering mainstream services to the mainstream people. Then why should our giving be mainly to ethnic causes? There could be the logic that Canada is, is a rich country. But let's look at the plight of the unfortunates in Canada and the need of philanthropic dollars to support our universities, hospitals, opera, museum, environmental causes, etc. And let me end my thoughts again by repeating what Swami Vivekanand said, they alone live who live for others. Finally, very special thanks to Krishan Mehta for his leadership in making this event happen and bringing such a wonderful team together. Please give him and his team a big round of applause. Thank you. It's not me. I did nothing. Uh, this is actually the work of a tremendous committee. Uh, Afshan, Arti, uh, Archna, Ashutosh. Uh, could you please stand and uh, take some uh, kudos from this crowd? This is the organizing committee along with Aditya, our chair. <laughs> Aditya, thank you very much for those uh, very provocative words. And uh, on behalf of AFP, we'd like to thank you by making a donation to a charity of your choice. There are many choices I know you have to make. This is for you. Thank you again. I now like to call upon Archana Sridhar, his assistant provost at the University of Toronto and co-founder of the South Asian Philanthropy Project, uh, an amazing blog that tracks uh, South Asian giving across the world, uh, to uh, start our panel discussion with our philanthropists. Archana. Hi everyone, um, I'm Archana and I want to welcome all of you again today and thank the AFP and Christian and all of the organizers. It's really, really wonderful to be here. Um, before I bring up our illustrious panel, I just wanted to acknowledge again, as everyone said, that this is truly a landmark event. We've been waiting for years to have exactly this kind of conversation about bringing South Asian leaders, philanthropists, nonprofit managers, and people from outside the community here together to talk about these themes. So I know so many of us are excited that this is finally here. Um, so I'll invite our panelists to come up. Um, I think we're going to have some microphones for them um, to pass back and forth. And while they're coming up, um, I'll just say that we're going to explore some themes. And in our format, I will ask some questions and we'll have 20 minutes at the end. But it'll be very important for everyone who wants to ask questions to come to the two microphones here. So... Um, So 
some of the themes that we would like to explore with all of you today are what motivates us to give? What's the role of our community in giving? Um, and so I'll ask maybe one question, and if you all want to answer, we, I'd love it if we stayed as informal, conversational as possible. You can speak with each other if you have anything you'd like to say by way of follow-up. Um, and maybe around three minutes a piece um, to answer our questions, and, and we'll see how much time we have to get through. But um, before we begin, any questions, I'd like to just introduce our panelists. You have the program, so I won't go into too much detail, but I'm joined by Dr. Terry Pupneja. Terry is president of AIM for Seva, a nonprofit organization focused on children's education in India. He also has a successful dentistry practice in Brampton and has raised more than $3 million over the past few years for projects in India. Nina Kanwar is here. She is president of, and CEO of KMH Cardiology and Diagnostic Centers. She serves on the boards of St. Michael's Hospital and the Sherborne Healthcare Corporation, and she's won numerous awards for her civic leadership and entrepreneurship success. And of course, Aditya Jar, notable keynote speaker. Um, many of the questions are going to follow directly on things that he said in his remarks. So I'm excited about that as well. Oh, yes. Thank you. So question number one that I wanted to start with is, what are some of your own main motivations for charitable giving? What are your own priorities for philanthropy? And looking over your bios, I see different priorities here in Canada and abroad. So I was hoping that you might speak a bit to that. And please feel free to include examples from your own experience. So Terry, if you'd like to begin. I guess like Aditya alluded, uh, we do take everything, whatever the resources we generate uh, from the surrounding, from the society. Society has an inbuilt social capital, like Aditya is saying. Uh, that's where, that becomes a, co you know, the re reason you are able to accumulate so much wealth. And a lot of philosophical article you read, as well as you experience, that when you help others, when you give, that's the time you feel a greater satisfaction in living. Uh, Ravindranath Tagore also, you know, one of the quotation is very famous, that you are born to live for others. And in process, you will be served by, helped by others as well. And if you can do best of your ability, there's nothing more satisfying to that. I personally, got involved, like I was born and raised in India. I did dentistry there in India and then came, came back here. So I always used to think like the Indian taxpayer paid for my education and I owe the debt to the society. So I wanted to give it back in some form or the others. And education was always close to my heart. That empowers, it's not when you educate a child you are educating and empowering them, them as well as the future generation of a child. So I became a part of an organization called Aim for Seva, where we make hostel for poor children. These poor children come from the remote areas of India where there are no roads, no school. So we bring them to these hostels in a bigger town, and then we provide them everything, and they go to the regular government schools and they are educated. And we take them to the finish line. Idea is that anybody wants to go to the college, university, or want to acquire some skill set, we will provide that. So from Toronto, the idea I floated, part of the committee members, as well as uh, other community leaders, we have been able to construct so far 20 hostels in India, from Toronto in 10 years. And we support 600 children every year for their education and food, all their needs. So this is what we have sort of been doing it. My experience is if you are transparent, you give the accountability where the fund is going, people do come back. Next year they want to donate. I have seen people, you know, even working $10, $15 an hour, and they will be happy to save $500 to support one child. And they have so much joy in doing it. And they have so much trust in giving us the money 
simply because we are able to show them how the funds are spent, what is the accounts, everything. And they see value in it, that how the money is helping, educating as some child. So our experience is good in the sense that people come, keep donating us year after year after year. And in gradually as it expands, uh, the name is spreads. I would say about good forty, fifty thousand dollars every year we get from the donors whom we have not approached. They come on their own and donate. So overall, is all it lies in when you are doing any charity work, how you can project the accountability and transparency, and you can show the value to the donor. You will be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'm a little bit different. Maybe I, I, um, um, I wanted to become a doctor since I was five years old, so it's because I wanted to look after sick people, so health care was my main priority. Um, but I didn't get into medicine. I suppose I was too charitable. So, <laughs> um, so but you... You know, following with that about wanting to take care of people and wanting to take care of sick people, um, I didn't give up that idea. So today I'm in healthcare. I'm providing a valuable service. It's a job that I love doing. So that's, you know, it's my passion. Um, when the uh, donation for Credit Valley came up, I saw the opportunity to actually help more people than I could have if I had become a doctor. So I think. You know, those those are kind of the things that uh, uh, motivate uh, me in terms of, and you know, I remember as a child watching um, the uh, the channel that the I forget what the channels are, but you know, they're showing the people in Africa and how they're starving, and I'm sitting there crying my eyes out. I'm I'm preparing. Um, I learned how to knit or cat or something, <laughs> and I'm making those things, and I'm selling them, and I'm sending money over there. My father could never understand what was wrong with me, <laughs> but <laughs> I think I just, you know, I, I like helping people. I sympathize with people who, um, I appreciate that I have a good life, and, and I feel for the people who don't, and if I can make a difference in their lives and make their lives better, then that, just, that gives me satisfaction. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. For me, uh, the motivation is uh, the, how passionate I am uh, with the cause, and that's very important. And also how well I can connect with the person who has approached me, because that's very, very important. It's just I am a name in the list, and then uh, they just call me. So I, 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 I would be normally a tough uh, person to uh, get money from. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, if, but if I'm connected, then it's different. Uh, it's very important for me. Uh, when I started, this has been a gradual process and learning and growing. Uh, but when I started and I was reflecting, when I sold, sold my first software company, and I came to the conclusion that I would like to support education. Even in education, I'm not a big believer in buildings and all that centers named was bursaries to for the student. Next phase would be um, uh, encouraging teachers to teach well. So to me, it's very important. Like I like, I love one thing about Canada is the universal health care. And I, I would wish if there was something universal education, anybody and everybody had all the means to study what they could. And that would not happen through the government funds, so the private giving has to be play a role. And the second one, which uh, just through evolution I picked up, was uh, the Aboriginal community. And uh, my focus is, uh, and Ashutosh here, he helped me a lot, is to nurture entrepreneurship. How can we bring the focus of wealth creation amongst the First Nation? Because we have a third world in first world Canada. And it's a big topic. It's a, it's a big problem for Canada. Serious, serious problem for Canada. So that's another one that how instead of them being economically dependent, they start contributing economically, be a well-off like any one of us. 
I love hearing the themes about entrepreneurship and um, bringing those skills um, that you all have. You know, even when you were a child, Nina, I love that story and talking about your background and also transparency and accountability. That's a huge theme that I hear from you all and from the community, South Asian community in general when it comes to this. Um, just taking what you said, Aditya Ji, and, and moving forward on that, we'll skip to sort of the question that I told you would come a little later, but it sounds like with our mixed audience of fundraisers and um, donors and nonprofit folks, um, I wanted to ask your candid thoughts, if you could speak a little more, and then both of you as well, about how you like to be asked to give. It sounds like you really do value the, making a connection with the person who asks or the fundraiser. I know that's probably the case with a lot of folks, but maybe a little bit more about that, um, how you like to be asked, and if there are any personal experiences you can share about that. That would be great, I think, for I can share a negative personal experience, but well, the positive... <laughs> yeah, either way. <laughs> but the positive is that I have done a serious selling job at Bell Canada in my own company, and what I have learned over the period is uh, selling is not sell something. If you're a successful salesperson, which we all are, is how well you motivate me in wanting to have something what you have to offer. And so the a way to approach is that motivational, the how do I motivate this person, not try to sell, oh, I have the best pen or I have the best microphone and buy it. Rather, motivate me. So that's the one. And... Um, Giving, there is something no, noble about giving uh, and for the philanthropic causes. I would like that you see that sense of nobility when you, when you meet a fundraising professional. It should not come as a cold cut approach. Like one place I um, uh, set up uh, endowment to, I, I don't want to give exact detail, <laughs> but I endowed for First Nation people to see something which otherwise they don't. And initially, the person who approached me accepted it, but I think whenever she sees me, she tries to avoid me because I would ask, did you call these First Nation people? Did they use that fund? Because I don't think she wants to even approach me because it's a lot of work, because I have made her life a little difficult. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, and same way, there was a, a huge event I did for to promote something Canadian in Nepal. And the person, I said, hey, don't spend money because you can waste too much of money. And it's a long story, but I tried my best to cut his expenses. I had uh, nice bottles of wine. I had him say, stay at the executive floor so that the drink is free, but he must go to the bar. <laughs> he must go to the bar because he wanted the ambience. But that really, uh, um, uh, for people like me, it's total uh, turn off. So... I would just say that these are the important things. Nina, I don't know if you have anything about um, how you like to be asked to give or if, if you're working with fundraisers. Or... Well, no, I don't, I don't really. I think for, for me it's more, more about um, I want to make sure that the majority of the funds are going to be used for the purpose that they're donated for. So I, I'm not interested in having the funds used for, you know, salaries for the CEOs and the executives and all of that kind of stuff. So those in giving to an organization, that would be what I would be looking for. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a lot of time to sort of, how should I say, babe, you know, find out what's happening to my uh, um, donation investment, so to speak. Once in a while, find out, I want to know that... Uh, what's being done, but just at the outset, I want to know what the funds are being used for, and I guarantee that they're going to be used for that purpose only. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I guess uh, it depends on the cause also, if you're passionate about the cause, where the money is being asked, that, and as well as how much impact you're going to create out of it. Those are the, you know, few considerations your mind is always evaluating. Many times, a lot of people come and they approach us. Uh, I'm a dentist, so a lot of patients' base is there. They are involved in charity work. And, and a lot of children have a school team, so they raise funds for it. So there are many, many projects they come along. 
So I guess that all depends on what you're passionate about and how the money is being spent as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, for our next question, I wanted to ask about what kind of shared values or shared vision do you think that we have as a community, as the South Asian community, when it comes to philanthropic impact? Or, or do we have shared values or vision? Um, and can South Asians do more in this space? And, and if so, how? So more about us as a community of givers or a community of philanthropists. I guess, South, like Aditya alluded also that uh, in our cultural bias, there's a lot of emphasis on giving. But at the same time also, we have to recognize South Asian community, you know, they, most of them are immigrants. Majority of them are the first generation. First generation is still busy overcoming the fear of uh, insecurity. They are not feeling secure in the new environment till the time they have established themselves. Uh, they have paid off all their debts, they have a house, or they feel comfortable, and then they start to give. But luckily I see now the second generation who has grown up here, and they have uh, the value of giving from early on. They are starting to work, but they are at the same time, they are giving, they are donating. They do not have those sort of fears and the insecurities of it. Of course, uh, South Asians who have done very well, even the first generations, they are giving very, very gener generously, and we are very proud of them. But uh, overall, I see that there's a lot of giving by the South Asians, people who have done well. But as at the same time, I see more is yet to come. The second generation is taking on and moving, joining at the cause. I think uh, our community is generally a giving community. Um, it's, you know, as long as you have enough to take care of your family, then um, the community um, likes to give. And I agree with you about the younger generation. I think they, they grew up in a different environment and, uh, and they have a different set of values. They want to go, um, for example, you know, to Africa or, or to um, India to, um, there's groups that you know teach English and and participate in those kinds of activities and stuff. So I think the younger generation um, probably um, does, I agree with you does more than perhaps the older generation. I think while we have the shining examples like Nina who have given multi million dollar to Credit Valley and Ajmeras to museum and uh, Vasit Sanchalani and many of them. I don't think we have that kind of shared vision that to give. If we are shared, then you are more to the temples and the mosques and uh, uh, religious and community organizations. Um, uh, and it's not because that we are not giving type, but I don't think it is, uh, we, we think every day, wake up and say, okay, I want to be on the fundraising committee of this university and that university. We don't do that. And I would say that that's why I'm so encouraged that the AFP has put up this uh, whole uh, uh, event that what you need to be, that you need to catalyze it and because, uh, because of all the f uh, things which I uh, also mentioned. So um, I, I don't see we are, we are as, a, as a group, as a community, very much geared towards giving to the mainstream things. I, I actually agree with you about the uh, temples and the mosques um, um, having a lot of funds and um, I guess it's been one of my, uh, I guess call it frustrations because I feel that um, those funds um, that are uh, raised at the temples and the mosques could actually be used to um, serve the uh, the community uh, of, to the people that are less fortunate. And it doesn't get done. Anything to add, Terry? Oh, I guess uh, all it is, the first generation donates in a smaller portion, a smaller amount. And um, obviously, um, the, you know, the temples and the mosques 
or the first place, place of worship. Um, churches have monthly fees. All the congregation members pay every month X number of dollars to be a member. In temple mass is voluntary. And I think they pay less than the what the fees the church, you know, people who pay in the churches. So it is still it's not a very large amount, <laughs> the amount wise. But uh, overall, I think the second generation is going to carry the torch well. And we will have the exam, you know, good shiny example uh, like donation done by Nina as well as others, the big amounts to the hospitals. And that, that basically other will follow. Yeah, please. I was hoping with this question to start a little bit of a conversation. I yeah, we don't want to get into a religious debate, but, you know, um, for, for example, you go to the Gurdwara and then, you know, everybody talks about seva and the langar and everything. And I was like, okay, fine. But there's people like me that are going over there to eat langar. Like, do, do I, like, do I need um, to be fed? No, I can pay for my own food. So I am not criticizing the Gurdwara or the, you know, the Sikh temples, but I'm just saying that we need to look beyond it. When we talk about seva, we need to look for people who actually need that seva. So that's sort of my controversial opinion. <laughs> we like to hear controversial opinions. I, I, I think we should not wait for the second generation to look after giving. No. Because the money has been made. And uh, I've seen personally, if you work with the plan with some of my colleagues, uh, I started with them giving $25,000 to, because I used to chair UNICEF uh, Canada's one campaign. And now, slowly, the same person has graduated a multi-million dollar giving. And it's hard for them, but once they get the taste, and there are certain things which I think it will take a lot of time, and that's why I mentioned about motivational environment. What tickles them pink? And that's not the normal thing. We I did some work with the McMaster, and I, I worked almost against my friend with the fundraising professional at McMaster. I said, do this, do that. Even little things like there were people waiting in the parking lot to have the car parked, and that was noticed. Even little things like that. You know, so there are many things which one can, uh, one understands the cultural nuances and just push them out the gate of giving. And it will be, it, this generation will give because they, they have, they know that they have been very fortunate, they have made significant money. That was the, we, I was going to do one more, but we can turn it over. I think we have, yeah, that's, that's fine. So if you want to come to the microphone, we can just go right into Q&A, and maybe I can fit in my question later. If, yeah, the, the, if you stand up there, there's two. There's one on the other side. So people can, you can line up or you can come up. and Please, go ahead. Passion for those causes? Um, I'm just going to repeat really quick because I don't think the microphone is working. We want to make sure it's recorded. So the question is about giving back to the home countries and um, really understanding what is going on there when the next generation comes up. Yeah, I'm a bit biased uh, and I wouldn't worry about uh, second generation worrying about the home country. I think Canada has its own bit of problems and especially when I look at the aboriginals you have almost a million people, and they have the highest suicide rate, the highest drunkenness problem, the most dropout rates from high school, um, the, the uh, kids becoming mother at 15, 17. I think if we can just focus on this country alone, and if they are giving enough, we give in nature, that is sufficient. So, uh, because India can look after, and other countries can look after their problems. Nina, do you have any thoughts? I like how we're getting the debate going. Yeah, yeah I was actually going to say I, I have faith in the Indian parent. Um, 
you know, <laughs> first of all, the emphasis is on education, and second of all, the emphasis is on appreciating what you have. And so, thirdly, the appreciation is on, on knowing that there's people out there who don't have what you have. Um, you know, if I didn't finish my, uh, my dinner, my mom would be pointing out regularly there's children starving in India that don't have this food. <laughs> And uh, I would be like, well, how's my eating it going to help them? But, <laughs> but, you know, it's just like I think the Indian parents do a good job in instilling the, that there are people that are less fortunate than you out there. And the second generation is going to find them. Terry, do you want to add anything about AIM for SEVA? Do you all have sort of young people involved? And maybe that might help towards the question as well. In AIM for SEVA, young people involvement is still less than what we like to be. We are still exploring that possibilities, how we can do. I've been to a couple of times to universities also to talking to student unions. Like uh, this year in Mississauga campus, we did the fundraising event for the AIM for SEVA through student union also. I think that would be a good starting place if more was, my focus was most to make them aware about AIM for SEVA and uh, uh, that, that was a good response. Uh, my, it was not important how much funds we have raised. More important was that they know what the AIM for SEVA is, what it does. You know, they have created social media uh, sites also. So that was uh, one of the way. Other, but otherwise, it is a challenging part unless they are already started to work. And uh, through, I guess, uh, word of mouth and joining some associations through there, it helps to encourage. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Sure. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. My question is perhaps a little educational based. How do you start educating and changing the frame of minds of uh, community members who have come from different parts of the world when it comes to giving locally? A lot, there's a large proportion of immigrants who come with the mindset, this is Canada, it's free health care. So why do I need to give locally to a health care initiative when the government is quote unquote supposed to support me? And instead they start, I am very patriotic myself, but those individuals would start sending bundles of money back home and supporting initiatives over there and not looking at the number of shelters where domestic abuse, violence women are living with a pregnant or with young children or the number of seniors who are going unfed because there is no place to feed them. So how do we start and who has that responsibility to, to change the mind shift of the community that yes, the country where we've all immigrated is a social country and it supports people, but that does not mean that we also start supporting locally whilst we continue to support back home. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, this uh, becomes the job of the a group like this, uh, the fundraising professionals, to go and, and uh, softly uh, educate and, um, uh, this group. So, and also the community leaders, that they have to say that, hey, we, we, we are holding prominent positions, we have uh, benefited immensely, from this system, so we have to give here. So, but this is a dialogue, it's a process, it's, it will take time, but uh, we must work on this in a very organized way. It's not about finding a South Asian person at uh, CNIB or some place and say, okay, you go and look after the South Asians. I think this will only happen when the mainstream fundraising professionals are able to acclimatize themselves, the cultural, nuances of giving within these new Canadian groups. And I think like perhaps the approach to um, the community from, from the fundraisers has to be a little bit different, right? It, it's not just a matter of, well, here's the hospital, here's what we're gonna do, or here's the shelter, here's what we're gonna do. It's like, yes, the government is gonna pay for it, but the government only has so much money. And so unless you want, you know, 80% of your taxes 80% <laughs> of your income going to the government, 
um, there has to be money that's coming from other sources and those other sources are our donations. So it is an education process and it is a slow process, but that I think as fundraisers, that's a role that you know fundraisers can play is the education piece. Anything, Terry, you'd like to add? I guess the whenever the need is understood, people will do something about it. Um, living in Canada, you know, it's a First Nation country where everything is being you know done well. Even like today's conference, you know, we are sitting in such a beautiful setup and we had a nice lunch as well. Thank you for organizers for providing Thank that. You. <laughs> <laughs> now, so we are not aware of it, the needs of the societies. And like Aditya said, is the fundraisers people have, you know, job cut out to if you educate population to the what is needed, then the people will respond to it. Like I was talking to Robin, six children hospital there is hundred million dollar a year because they are able to project the need of the sick children hospital. And the same way other causes, that's what basically need to be done and thus uh, people will respond to it. We are a very generous society here. Um, before we move to the next question, we'll go to the other mic um, for the next question. I just realized um, that we need to just define a, like one major term is seva that we've all been talking about. So maybe Terry, if you just want to give everyone a quick Definition. I know we've been throwing out some words and not everyone will have the definitions. Christian reminded me that's a, an important one. Seva is a Sanskrit word, Hindi word, meaning is service. It says, in the, like in Sanskrit, it means service without expectation of any return. We basically just want to do the service. That's the meaning of Seva. Aim for Seva is an all India movement for Seva. Our idea is more and more people all across India will join the cause and it will grow. So far total we have made 100 hostels in last 10 years where we collect donation from all over the world as well as from India. So the whole organization is growing and people are joining and that's what it is. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the other mic for the next question. This woman was first, however, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> if, if I might. Okay, thank you. Um, the word frugality, uh, or the, the topic of frugality, was brought up um, earlier. And um, along that line, I wish you would um, share your opinion on foundations whose sole um, mandate is to support a charity and the trend right now to rolling those foundations into the main charity. If you have an opinion on that, I'd like to hear that, please. Can you repeat the last part? Can you repeat the last part? Yes, there's a trend right now for charities that also have a foundation partner. The foundation's mandate is typically to serve the charity. And there's a trend uh, right now for a lot of those foundation, or for those foundations to be collapsed into the main charity because in some views, um, what's really happening is there's two audits, there's two boards, there's uh, two um, uh, perspectives to manage and um, it, ca it can be um, a bit of a duplication. So I'm wondering if you have an opinion on that. As, as a philanthropist, would you be, would you be um, more inclined to give to the foundation or would you be more inclined to give directly to the charity? Personally, I would like to give it to the charity, you know, and uh, uh, then putting one more layer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't always seen the benefit of uh, amalgamating everything. And then, uh, because that also can become a very heavy, heavy organization. So I would prefer to give it to the charity. Any other thoughts? Or it's I, I, yeah. I guess I see foundations more as local organizations. Is that, um, and then charities more as uh, uh, other national or global organizations. So I don't have an opinion about the mergers, but that's kind of how I see them. Okay, next question. 
I have two questions. One I'll ask in the capacity of a South Asian coordinator for the United Way of Peel region. Uh, we are struggling with fundraising from the community because in the in Peel region, 49% is visible minorities. And they, we understand that we need to have a responsibility towards uh, the community and we need to give back. And I find it really struggling being a South Asian coordinator to reach out to South Asian uh, entrepreneurs and we find it hard. They generally end up giving to their religious places. So would want to know the tips of how to go about. This is my first question. As a United Way of Peel Regions coordinator for the South Asian community. I guess you can pick up the causes like uh, United as a United Way, what all the causes you want to spend the money into it. And maybe you can divide that in a small portion. Say, for an example, you have a particular project, you need a hundred donors of $500 each. So people have a you know, amount and they can calculate how much they can be part of it. So suppose you can identify maybe four specific needs and then you present to the donor and see whatever their hard desire to help in particular need, that they will connect to it. They are passionate about it. And you have already divided in the smaller units. You have to always lead to them. Uh, if you suppose you go to somebody to ask donation, there is no starting point they don't know. So suppose you have two, three categories. One is small, other is medium, and third is bigger. Um, people will try to fit in wherever they like to be. And then personally, you have to go to individuals. Like, uh, you have to walk into all the business owners, and they will connect to those needs. You will be surprised if you personally go, even if you decide, you know, 10 visits every day, each visit won't take more than 20, 30 minutes. And I would say you will have a success rate of good about 30 to 40 percent. I agree with you. I have a contrary view to what uh, Terry said. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, United Way is such a wonderful brand and in the mainstream. But I don't hear about United Way into the South Asian community. I am there, you know, and I have a fairly good um, uh, network. We don't talk about it. So I think there is a job cut out for United Way, which is such a respectable organization, such an effective organization, that how do you bring in um, uh, that same brand, uh, create the same brand? So that's the one. I think in this saga, there is a, a wonderful example is Trillium Hospital. And the way they succeeded from, uh, in um, getting fund raised through the South Asians, that even the main event of Trillium Hospital got stopped, and they started raising 600,000 after all expenses from Diwali function. Mm -hmm. And the key was, uh, and I have watched it year after year, you find one or two key person and somehow just bring them in to lead it. Because if the way Terry said it, if you go knock door, I don't think you will have that success. But if you have somebody in front of you who is very, whose brand is very good, and that person pitches, and he can bring in four or five friends, and sometime, and that, that will add even to the hospital, this is five, ten people who will, add, uh, uh, who will contribute 50% of the total amount to be raised. But you, you need that person in the front of you instead of the retail way of uh, raising funds. So that's, that's my thought. I have an answer to your first point about having said that you haven't heard about South Asians in the United Way. Well, for that matter, probably you are from your Toronto, right? Mississauga. Uh, Mississauga, because United Way of Peel region is the only United Way in the whole of North America that has begun with the diverse councils. And we've been there for about a year now and we are working hard to spread our word. And this is probably one of the means why I'm spreading my word of South Asian <laughs> Council. <laughs> so I found that a nice excuse to do that. So now you know there is a South Asian Advisory Council <laughs> at the United Way of Peel Region. And it's going to reach you now. <laughs> Nina, do you have any thoughts to add? Any tips? Or? No. Uh, not right now. Okay. You're um, going to come to me, Nina as well very soon. <laughs> Um, and 
Any other thoughts? Um, then uh, the, the second question I had was in the pu personal capacity as a new immigrant. I'm still a new immigrant, not even finished my 1,075 days a year in Canada. And I have a slight, you know, a very respectfully disagree with you people when you say that the first generation doesn't give and the second generation. They may be, yes, giving, the second generation may be giving traditionally as a charity. But as a first generation, I'll tell you my story. I came in here three years ago with $87,000 in my hand. For two years, I stayed without a job. It's just one year that I'm employed part-time with United Way. The $87,000 that I spent here on in Canadian community, which I did not earn a single penny here, is the kind of contribution that I've made here. So please, I think it would be a little belittling to say that the first generation doesn't give. And I'm only 87,000, I've heard of people given half a million, 200,000, 300,000 brought in from outside. So that should be taken into consideration as well. Thank you. Um, let's go to the other microphone for the next question. So I, I had a question for you as a second generation Canadian. I, I grew up listening and watching our community and our temples and mosques where individual members would give $20, $50 and support an entire uh, organization. So I know there's been discussion where we've said that the charitable giving often focuses in on temples or you know community institutions. I was curious to know if you had seen any examples of charities that were outreaching to these cultural associations or temples or mosques and getting the temples or mosques on board with their charities and working with them. If you can cite any examples you've seen and if you haven't, uh, where do you see that opportunity and how could it be developed? 